Okay, we are ready to begin. First, I would like to welcome you to Quill Healthcare's second monthly value added webinar. Quill Healthcare is the leading seller of medical and office supply products and is dedicated to providing you with useful content in these webinars purely as a value add to your practice. And I'm absolutely certain that today's session, how to improve your front desk performance, will send each of you away with many tips that will help you improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of your practice's operations. Today's topic will be presented by Mr. George Conamikes, who is the head of the practice consulting firm, Conamikes Associates. George's firm has undertaken over a thousand on-site consulting assignments throughout the U.S., and George has been the editor and publisher of the Conamikes Report about medical practice management for over 20 years. The Conamikes organization has also presented practice management workshops sponsored by over 35 specialty state and medical associations. George is a prominent speaker. In fact, he is an economist who formerly taught at the University of Chicago, uh, where he was also the head of the Commerce Department. In addition, he has been a guest lecturer in over 15 universities and colleges. He is listed in several who who's, who's who in America, who's who in the world, and other who who's. We are really pleased to have George with us today. Briefly, I would like to introduce myself and my partner, Susan Charkin. We're consultants with Quill Healthcare, and combined, we have over 35 years of experience in the healthcare and computing industries. So we bring a collection of skills here to assist as well, including other topics related to practice management, healthcare consultancy, and healthcare payer contracting. So we're very pleased to emcee this session on behalf of Quill Healthcare, and we will commence the session. Now, before we get started with the main event, and before I turn the floor over to Mr. Conamikes, I do have a few administrative matters, and one of the things that we um, would welcome here is your participation. These sessions tend to be much more valuable if we end up with a with an interactive dialogue with thoughtful questions uh, coming from you, the audience. So we welcome this being a team event, a team sport, so to speak, and we would really like you to ask questions in whatever form you're most comfortable asking those questions. One way you can do so is by simply sending an email to info at healthsense.com at any time during this session. In doing so, we will gather the questions and during breakpoints in this discussion, we will pause and we will ask your questions for you and answer them. Additionally, uh, when we get to uh, breakpoints during this session, I will pause and allow you to go ahead and ask your questions live. And all you need to do at that point is simply press asterisk six on your phone to ask your question. And then I ask you, uh, when you're done, asking your question and interacting with George and I to please, once again, press asterisk six on your phone because that will mute your line and enable a much more usable and user-friendly experience for all of those participating in this session without background noise. So again, to ask your question during breaks, you can simply press asterisk six on your phone. And then when you're done conversing, press asterisk six again, or at any time, uh, beginning now, you may send your questions to info at healthsense.com, and they will be retrieved by my partner, Ms. Susan Charkin, and uh, she will ask your questions for you. If for some reason, you lose connection to this web session, you can, of course, dial back in on, on the telephony side uh, to the phone number information and conference IDs that you have. But you can also go to join.me slash healthsense and if, and in any browser, and you will be instantly restored uh, to this webinar session. Additionally, as I mentioned, we are recording the session and the recording will be made available 
to all webinar participants as well. And just to uh, test the mechanism before I turn the floor over to Mr. Connemikes, what I'm going to do uh, for the moment is I'm going to go ahead and unmute uh, the line so that people can ask. And if you have any questions at this time before we start um, about the administration of this session, uh, please press asterisk 6 on your phone and go ahead and ask your question. So I will pause for just a moment before I turn the floor over to George. Okay. Silence usually is a sign of no additional questions. So with, without further ado, Hello. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, did you have a question? I do. Um, my name is Donna. I'm calling from Gary from Community Health Net. Um, I'm the clinical nurse manager here. I was wondering if you're able to copy the presentation slides after. Yes. Uh, at the end of the session, and thank you for asking that question, Donna. At the end of the session, I will provide everybody who is here instructions about how to obtain a PDF copy instantly at any time of this entire slide deck. So that will be made available. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could press, once again, asterisk 6, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. George Conomikes. George, take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve, for that nice introduction, and thanks to uh, Quill Healthcare for sponsoring this important workshop. Uh, our company, Conomikes Associates, I happen to be the head of it. Uh, as Steve mentioned, we've done over 1,000 on-site assignments with all specialties, all sizes of practices from solo to large groups. And our major type of activity is called improving practice performance and profitability. And most of these consults we have found need a redesign of front desk activities, which is why we chose this topic for today. And some recent examples of practices I've been to, uh, I was at a two-doctor rheumatology practice in Los Angeles about three weeks ago and their front desk was a major problem, and we told them how to reorganize it. Two weeks earlier, I was in Texas with an eight-doctor gastroenterology practice, and again, this practice had problems at the front desk, and we'll be referring to both of these practices and others as we go through. The other assignment that we seem to do a lot of right now is practice valuations for a practice sale or purchase. As a lot of you know, a lot of hospitals are seeking practices, and a lot of large groups are seeking smaller practices. And what we do is we help the doctors know what the value of the practice is. So these are our two major activities as a background. Now, next slide, front desk activities vary. As we know, the more doctors, the more front desk activity. Uh, and also, as a rule of thumb, we find that primary care practices have more traffic at the front desk per physician uh, than the other specialties, on top of which primary care physicians see a few more patients per day and per week uh, than the other specialties do. So now we'd like to find out more about you. And I'm going to turn this over to Steve, who will do the polling with you. OK, and thank you very much, George. And I mentioned this is going to be a team event. And besides asking your questions, uh, we'd like, we're going to be asking you uh, throughout this session about uh, four questions. This is the first of the four to learn a little bit more about your practices. And the first thing I want to mention is that your answers are obtained instantly and anonymously. So uh, we don't know who is answering, but it is most helpful if you would uh, participate in answering these uh, short questions. And I will show you how to do that. 
uh, first of all, the question here is how many physicians are in your practice? Are you a solo practice? Answer A. Are you a practice of two to five physicians? Answer B. Are you a practice of six to ten, to ten physicians? Answer C. Or 11 or more. Now, the way that you go about answering these questions is to go to www.healthsense.com slash q1. Again, www.healthsense.com slash q1. It is very important in doing so that you use small letters. It will not work if you have capital letters. So I will give everybody a moment and I will illustrate how you go about answering this question. Again, go to www.healthsense.com slash q1. Select your answer and we'll go from there. And I will show you as if I were answering the questions uh, as you are, how you go about doing that. So you simply go to www.healthsense.com slash q1 and when you get to that that, that question, it will be the same question. How many physicians are in your practice? You pick your answer and click done. Simple as that. So I will wait about 60 seconds for that to occur. Then we will take a look at the results. So again, go to www.healthsense.com q1 to do your polling on this question. How many physicians are in your practice? wait just a little bit longer, give everybody an opportunity, and then pick it up. Okay, let's take a look at what the answers might look like. Okay, so here is what we have. We have 51 responses. So the first thing is I would like to thank those of you that participated and encourage you to continue to do so during this session. And George, uh, here is what we have. Solo, uh, we get about 27% of the audience um, with 14 uh, as the count. 2 to 5, about 50%. 6 to 10, about 10%. And 11 or more, about 11%. And you know, I find this interesting because on the uh, broader set of data that I've seen from sources such as Info Group, uh, that while there are about 50% of the physicians uh, currently in the U.S. that are part of uh, largely merged practices, 10 or greater in size, still the vast number of practices tend to be solo to five physician practices. And sure enough, we can see about 77% um, that have taken this survey um, are in that situation. So we have, um, again, about 77% uh, solo to five. George, did you have any other uh, comments about this particular? Well, that fits in roughly with the data that's available from the American Medical Association and also for, from list companies that keep track of physicians. Uh, you'd think with all the hospitals buying practices uh, which they've been doing in great numbers the past three to five years, uh, you'd have less solo and less two to five. Uh, but that seems to have held, and a number of hospitals have actually brought in these small groups and just stopped at that point. So 75% between one and five doctors is not out of the question. So that's that's a pretty healthy range. Yes, yes, and uh, you know, as I say, what I found revealing as well is the info group uh, list service, uh, which when when asked the question about number of practices, again, it's in about this range, 75%, one to five physician practices, yet 50% of the, when asked the question about um, how many physicians belong to practices that are greater than 10 in size, there are at least half of the physicians today that are in these larger practices. But again, this uh, illustrates the importance of the small practice. So while there are a lot of mergers and hospital-based groups and ACOs uh, forming, uh, these small practices still comprise the lion's share of practices in the United States. So thank you for participating and answering that question. And now we're going to go to our second of four questions. 
which is we'd like to know a little bit about the type of practice uh, that you are. Um, is your practice a primary care uh, specialty only? Answer A. B, a specialty practice, or C, a multi-specialty practice? Okay, so please go to healthsense.com slash Q2. That's healthsense.com slash Q2. And as before, uh, you will simply go to your browser, go to www.healthsense.com, like here, slash Q2, and up comes a question. Is your practice a primary care, specialty, or multi-specialty? So again, let me give you a moment to do this. Just go to healthsense.com slash Q2. Just like you see above here. All small letters. And again, these are anonymous uh, answers. We do not uh, catalog who answers the questions. We simply catalog the totals. Okay, let's take a look at the results and see what we have. Okay. So again, similar number of responses, uh, 49. About 30% of you are, 31% are primary care. About 55% are specialists and 14% are multi-specialty uh, practices. George, any uh, comments about this distribution that we see among our audience? That's uh, oddly enough about the distribution we see uh, that roughly one third of practices in the United States are primary care, which is family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, and uh, 50, 60% are specialty practices, uh, non multi-specialty and multi-specialty practices uh, used to be only five to ten percent now we can see they're approaching fifteen percent and probably within the next year or two will be closer to twenty percent but that distribution fits in with, with the national data okay all right uh, very good thank you George um, also I, I see a couple of comments uh, <clears throat> flashing by, I just want to uh, comment. One one is uh, to make sure we're speaking loudly enough, so uh, let's make sure both of us uh, keep our voices as close to our mics as possible. Uh, but the other question that I saw flash by uh, was from a dental practice, and we do, um, out of deference to the audience, we do have uh, various types of medical providers on the line. And while the uh, charts and the questions are somewhat geared toward a physician practice, uh, what I'd like to point out is that many of the techniques and uh, many of the uh, challenges that Mr. Conomikes will be explaining um, are definitely pervasive and inclusive to dental practices, um, chiropractors, uh, even you know, veterinary practices, you name it. So, um, you know, definitely bear with us there while the uh, presentation is kind of geared at the physician practice. I think you know you'll find that regardless of the type of office you're running, that 95% or more of the material is applicable. Okay, so we'll uh, continue on from here. And thank you for participating in those two questions. We'll have two more for you in a short time, and and we will be also pausing for question and answer. So please continue, George. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, talk about what the front desk was like in past years. Uh, first off, there was less volume per doctor. Uh, what we've seen in the past 15, 20 years uh, is doctors, in order to make a living that they made before, if they used to see 12, 15 patients a day, now are seeing 15 to 18 patients. And this is where we've seen the increased use of uh, physician's assistance taking place. That boom has been started by the fact that uh, physicians 
want to see more patients, one way to do this is to bring in PAs and nurse practitioners. But in the past, the front desk, although it was busy uh, greeting patients, answering the phone, scheduling appointments, and collecting from patients as they were exiting, uh, we go to the next slide and we look at the front desk today. As I mentioned before, doctors are seeing more patients per week, in many cases more patients per day. Uh, what we found is the use of physician's assistants, for example, allows a doctor that normally saw 15 to 20 patients now sees with a PA uh, about 30 to 35 patients. Therefore, we have a lot more activity because of this taking place at the front desk. So there have been a lot of changes, and today front desk still greets patients, but now they do a lot of work getting demographic data from the patients, especially starting with the new patients uh, to get all the data they need and for established patients, uh, a simple idea is to uh, give them a copy of their past data because patients that haven't been in in 120 days or more, good chance their insurance might have changed, they might have moved, they might have changed phone numbers, might have changed employers. Excuse me, George, I apologize for interrupting, but I have seen a few participants requesting a louder voice. Okay. I will. Thank you very much. I will uh, put the phone closer to my mouth. <laughs> Next doc, collecting deductibles, co-pays, and past due <laughs> balances. Deductibles and co-pays have skyrocketed in the past few years. Right now with Obamacare, deductibles are in the thousands of dollars. And worse than the higher deductibles <laughs> is the fact that many new enrollees, because of Obamacare, are more naive about deductibles, co-pays, and the rest, and they require a lot more hand-holding at the front desk. Front desk still answers and directs phone calls. Front desk still schedules appointments, uh, but they do much, much more than they did in the past. So that leads to problems at the front desk, which is in our next slide. Okay, and I'm uh, I'm sorry, just another quick interrupt. I would ask uh, anyone who does not have their phone on mute to please uh, mute it out of deference to everyone else on the line. I'm also going to put the all of the lines on mute, but uh, there would be a couple of Quill lines uh, open, and I would ask those uh, at Quill Healthcare to please make sure that your lines especially are on mute because even when I perform this function, your lines will still come through if they're not on mute. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for clearing that up. Here's today's front desk. Patient confusing, being confused. Too many staff. Patients sometimes don't even know who to check in with at some practices. Front desk, if they do not collect what they should be collecting, whether that's co-pays or deductibles or normal charges, uh, means that the billing staff has to do it. So if we don't collect and we don't update our patient demographic data at the same time, uh, it puts more onus on the billing staff. We have a lot of phone traffic. And most front desks today, the phones are ringing. We've been to some practices that don't answer the phone until 10 or 12 rings, which is really bad service. Patients sometimes are put on hold for long periods of time. That's not good service. There's sometimes a lot of noise at the front desk because of the ringing of the phones, patients being talked to on their way in, and patients being talked to on their way out. Believe it or not, there are also a lot of staff conflicts are caused by this. We recently were at a practice of six doctors, and there were three people at the front desk. They all were doing the same tasks, and what we find out uh, during the interview process is they seem to get in each other's way because they really said openly that they didn't care that much about each other, which really is not a good way to run a medical practice. So then the question, given these problems, is <laughs> what are some of the solutions? So these three 
suggested solutions will be covered in depth during the next few minutes. So the first solution is what can we do to eliminate or reduce phone traffic to the front desk? Secondly, what can we do in the patient check-in and collections activity at the front desk? Now let's stop on that one. We could have two or more staff. Uh, we could have one person perhaps at the hello window, another person checking out at the goodbye window, which we like to call it. Next, telephone appointment staff. Uh, telephone and appointment staff focus mainly on making appointments for the patients. So I need to remind you that I'm going to be presenting you with options on these solutions that have worked at many practices. These are not originals with us, but we've had practices that have addressed these problems and solved them. And what we're going to do is share this with you. So I want to caution you that, that these options do not mean that all of them will work with you, but if you get one or even a few good ideas with this webinar, it'll be worth your valuable time. So let's shift over now to how can we eliminate and reduce phone traffic to your front desk. What we've seen work at a number of practices is to have dedicated lines, one type of specialized line would be the appointments phone line. Well, first of all, let me talk about this, the reason we suggest this. If you do a survey of incoming calls, and we've done a number of these, we always find that a plus or minus 50% of the callers are calling for an appointment. And so we really believe that there should be an appointments line that is staffed by an appointments person who also could be the backup for other phone traffic. Now your billing staff, whether it's one person, two or more, should have their own line. And when a person gets a bill and they have questions about it, they don't call the practice's main line, they call the line that's on the bill. Uh, which goes directly to your billing staff, whether your billing staff is one, two, or more people. Now, the other line that we've seen working at practices is what we call the nurse line. This is the line where referring physician practices call. Uh, there are calls for physicians or nurses. That line would be used. And people that are calling for medical advice would be calling on that line. Now let me stop and indicate that all these lines would be clearly communicated to your patients when they first become your patients. And last but not least is a manager line because the manager is there to get calls from physicians, suppliers, and the rest. So these four lines with separate numbers should be on business cards that are given to all patients when they become patients. The result of having these separate lines is you'll have less phone traffic going directly to one or two people at the front desk, and these direct lines also help the patients not being on hold and getting directly to the person they want to talk to, whether that's the appointments person, the nurse, or somebody else. What else could we do? Well, what we might consider is a patient check-in and collection staff. This usually means two or more staff, but in a smaller practice, a one-doctor practice, this may be done by one person, depending upon your phone tra your traffic, because if we have one doctor seeing 15 to 25 patients, doctor is seeing three patients, probably 3.5 patients per hour, and therefore, we don't have log jams at the front desk of people coming in and calling in. So the prime test task of the patient check-in collection staff people is to greet and collect. Now, today we have co-pays. Today we have deductibles. 
and we have other charges, and we do everything possible to collect those at the front end. Uh, the other task of the patient check-in and collections person is to get demographic data, collecting it. First, with new patients, when they check in, we want to be sure that they fill out name, address, phone numbers, insurance, insurance numbers. And it's important that the front desk check this data to be sure that all the data the practice needs has been filled out. So we do that when the patient hands it in to us. For established patients who haven't been in in 90 days or more, here is the problem. They could have moved. They could have changed phone numbers. They could have changed employers. They could have changed insurance. So what we want to do when the established patient comes in that hasn't been in for three or four months, we want to print out the demographic data that we have on them, hand it to them with a red pen, and say to them, would you please check this data and be sure that it's accurate and make any changes you want, and you provide them with a red pen so that they can make those changes. So on top of what we have here, another thing that will help patient check-in and collection staff is the preparation for today. And what we recommend is one to two days in advance of, a, of the appointment day that people get reminder calls and emails. Now, let me stop on this one. Uh, we think it is very important that all practices get email information from patients. A lot of practices have told us that emails are more effective for reminder contact than making phone calls. By the way, it also involves less time. So we could use the emails for appointment reminders. Uh, we could e use emails to remind people at the same time about co-pays and deductibles. And for those of you that are interested in knowing how this information could be gathered, your computer system or your clearinghouse can provide you help uh, determining how you can prep a patient by email or better than by telephone. So the whole idea here is to improve your front desk collection. And this, this is a good start. The next point is having telephone and appointment staff. What do we recommend here? One or more staff be the prime phone receptionist who answers incoming calls. Now let's stop for a minute. We just talked about dissipating the amount of phone calls. So if your practice has one line for incoming calls, what number? and receives 150 or 200 calls a day, by simply doing what we talked about a few minutes ago, which is separate phone lines for appointment scheduling, separate phone lines for nurse appointments, separate phone lines going directly to the billing and collection staff, then our phone traffic will be reduced significantly. And therefore, the prime phone receptionist will not be answering as many calls as he or she did in the past. And that then is backed up by our prime appointment scheduler who answers the appointment line. And remember, again, that appointments represent about 50% of your incoming phone traffic. Next, in some practices we've been to, when patients are told by the physicians to come back in one month, three months, or six months, the back office staff, whether that's a medical assistant or an RN or a PA, will schedule that in the back office area rather than the patient having it done up front. So this is another option for you to consider if it's possible for your back office staff to set up future appointments with patients that are there today. 
The second thing, excuse me, not the second, the last thing we're talking about on this slide is consider hands-free phone headsets. The practices we've been to that are using these phone headsets tell us two things. Number one, it reduces the noise level. Number two, it reduces the stress. It allows people to be able to use both hands to be able to make notes. So next, what we want to do now is we also want to address the question of peak hours and peak days. And again, what I'll do is I'll turn this over to Steve. Okay, thanks, George. I did see a couple of comments. Again, people say that the voice intermittently is cutting in and out, so I just uh, Thank you. want to remind if you can uh, speak loudly close to the mic, that will help Thank a little you. bit. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. As far as the uh, the participants go, this is a great time for us to actually take some live questions and move into question and answer mode. So just give me a moment. I first need to put the line into question and answer mode, then I'll explain to you once more how you can go ahead and ask your questions. Okay. Now, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, um, let us begin. You may begin simply by pressing asterisk and then six on your phone. Then you can ask your question, uh, dialogue with George. And when you're done, please remember again to press asterisk six on your phone line. So, for anyone that would like to ask a question, now is a great time. Please jump in. Press asterisk six and please ask your question. Okay, well, while the audience is gathering up its questions, I understand that we have received a few at info at healthsense.com, so I'll turn the floor over to my colleague, Ms. Susan Charkin. She has a few questions that she will be asking George on your behalf. Susan? Um, you need. I think you need to press asterisk six on your phone. Nobody is hearing you. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time this afternoon. This is Susan Charkin. I have uh, a couple of questions that came in at info at healthsense.com. The first one is regarding appointment reminders, George. Uh, emailing for appointment reminders. Do those emails have to be HIPAA compliant, and if so, how? So if you can ask that one, and then I have another one as well. Uh, you mean do they have to comply with HIPAA? The Correct, question? because they're email reminders is one of the questions. Do those email reminders have to comply with HIPAA? No, they don't have to comply with HIPAA because it's a one-way communication and we're not uh, indicating the name of the patient. All we're saying to the patient is your appointment with Dr. Jones is scheduled for 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday, December 7th. Okay. Okay. Very good. Because most people, and the next, most, that's a good question because most people, their emails are private emails dedicated mainly to one person. Okay. And then the other question I have that came in is, as far as what is the biggest challenge that you've seen with staff in, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, with front office staff, and uh, what would you recommend just overall? And this might be redundant from some of the information that you've done, but what is the biggest challenge that you've that you've seen? In, in your years of, of doing this, and how has it been solved? Well, I think the number one way to do this, and a lot of practice managers have told us this, is to really involve the staff in trying to solve their front desk problems and make it a total staff effort, because sometimes your nursing staff and sometimes your billing staff that's not at the front desk have some very good ideas, and it's critical that involve everybody because there may be a redelegation of work. Uh, for example, I've already suggested that we might consider having a back office staff as backup when the phone lines are t terribly busy. Uh, that's a possibility. But I think that uh, that's a manager's job is to try to bring the front desk as a problem area 
uh, to the attention of everybody, every, every non-clinical uh, staff member at the practice. You might even include non-physician staff as well uh, in this process. Most people have told us they got their best ideas from their own staff, not from attending a workshop or any, any other means. Uh, just a, a quick um, interrupt during this Q&A. I have seen a couple of um, instant messages flash by. And for those that join the session maybe a little bit later, I just want to mention that we will be providing complete copies of these slides. At the end of the session, um, we'll be explaining exactly uh, how you go about requesting and immediately obtaining those copies. So uh, they will be made available uh, following this session. So I just uh, want everybody to be aware of it, and you'll be able to request them. And we'll explain that at the end. So continue on, please. Okay. And we have one more question for George. And this is from a dental office. Are there any particular uh, items that would be different for how a dental office is run as far as their front office staff versus a physician office? Uh, not that I, well, one thing is, the, uh, the, the question is what percentage of uh, your patients have dental insurance? And it is the dental insurance patients that need to be given a different type of message uh, regarding their co-payments, if any, are required for the visit or the service to be rendered. Aside from that, I think, again, uh, they could employ email, and I, I think they could do the same type of reminders that other practices do. Uh, a key issue on this is some practices have found that reminder calls, no matter what the specialty, whether it's dental or medical, uh, done two days in advance or sometimes better than one day in advance, because if we do it a day in advance, and a person is at work and they come home at night to a reminder call and realize that they have something on their agenda that will preclude their coming the next day, uh, it might be better to do the reminder calling uh, two days in advance so people, if they cannot make the appointment, could call and allow you to work somebody else in. So that's a very good question, Susan. Thanks. And I might uh, add, uh, George and Susan, as well, that um, for medical practices, uh, particularly that have uh, patients who may be in the health insurance exchanges, one of the trends uh, that we're seeing is a much higher percentage of, uh, well, much higher deductibles and much higher uh, coinsurance and copayments um, potentially for those types of patients. So it's very important to do the uh, patient verification following some of the processes that uh, George is indicating up front in terms of benefits verification. And certainly for dental office, uh, it's apropos because you're likely to have a much uh, higher portion of payment required from the patient. So having the business processes in place to do the upfront verification uh, with the health insurance company, not just to verify that the patient has a benefit, but nowadays to make sure that you know what the patient obligation is, and then for office visits, being able to collect for that up front it becomes very key. That's a good point, Steve, because one of the key questions that should be addressed uh, with patients is to verify what plan they belong with, because people nowadays have plan, are changing plans more frequently than ever before. Some uh, Employers are changing plans more frequently. Some are dropping coverage, and people have to pick up their own coverage. So the first question is eligibility, because when we do our uh, pre in, getting the information in advance, we want to check that person's statement on insurance because they might have had certain insurance 90 or 120 days ago. And what we may want to do is verify their insurance in the reminder call two days in advance and then call the plan to find out if they still are enrolled. Because that's the new uh, trick nowadays that a number of people are not aware that their insurance plan has changed. And it might be within the same Blue Shield plan, but it may be plan A versus plan D. So thanks for the, uh, bringing that up, Steve. 
Okay, thank you. And um, I saw a viewer had a question about a smaller office. Unfortunately, the entire question didn't fly by on chat. If you'd like to ask your question, please press asterisk six and uh, come on in and join the question and answer session. We'd be glad to answer it. Maybe their phone's not active. Okay. Uh, Susan, any other uh, questions for us here? No, I think we are ready to what? move on. Oh, I think Sorry. we have. I thought I heard a voice here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Sharon. I have a question that was actually asked, but I somehow missed the answer. I heard the question. <laughs> um, regarding the email reminders, which I think is a great idea, what was the answer to that about those having to be HIPAA compliant or not? Uh, there's no problem because you don't have to, in uh, email communication on HIPAA, uh, because you don't have to identify the name of the patient when you're calling. You just say, first name, George, this is your appointment reminder for Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. with Dr. Jones, and that's all you need to say. And you could say, P.S., if there are any problems with this appointment, please call blah, 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 the following and okay. say the following person with a direct line to that person. All right. Thank you so much. That's a very good question. Thank you. And again, uh, you. for those that ask questions, when you finish the dialogue, if you could please once again remember to press asterisk 6 on your phone. That will help uh, everybody on the line, including yourselves, to hear better. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think with that, uh, George, uh, we're ready to uh, continue on. I think we want to now uh, do a, a survey of peak hours and peak days of operation. Are, are we ready to do that, Steve? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, we're going to ask uh, the final two questions back to back. And for those uh, that have been on the line, I'll remind you how we do that. And for those that may have joined in flight here, I'll also uh, explain uh, this short process. First of all, uh, the question is, what are your peak hours of operation? So we're going to be asking you first about peak hours of operation. Then we're going to be asking you about peak days. And um, here we have three choices between 8 and 10 a.m. is answer A. Around 11 to 1, excuse me, around 1 to 3 is answer B, and other is answer C. Um, to actually answer the questions, go in a browser session to healthsense.com slash Q3, all small letters, as you see here. And these answers uh, that you give are all anonymous, uh, so we don't know who is answering the questions. We're simply tabulating numbers to make it interesting for all of you to kind of see um, what the patterns are relative to peak hours and days of operations. This question is about peak hours. Again, A is around 11, 8 to 10. B is 1 to 3, and C is others. So let me illustrate once more um, how you go about answering the question anonymously. So you go to lsense.com, in this case, slash Q3, just like you see in my browser. And there's the question. And you simply choose the circle that represents your answer and click Done, and you're done. So again, healthsense.com, in this case, uh, Q3, just like that. I'll wait a few more seconds, and then we'll go take a peek at what the tabulation of answers look like from the group. This is kind of like, for those of you who have been in the ballroom, where they give you those little handheld devices, and you press a red, green, or yellow button type of thing. So. This is our virtual voting. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look, uh, see what we have here. Okay, so first of all, thank you again. We got 53 responses. Uh, looks like the winter is around 8 to 10, seems to be the busiest times for most of the practices on the phone. Um, we had about 47%, about 19% from 1 to 3, and that other uh, was 34%. So, uh, George, any um, further insights on that one? Well, um, 
the first hour of the day and every day is usually the busiest and uh, uh, we'll address how to uh, decrease that traffic uh, later on and but that and that's true to form 40 to 60 percent of the calls come in within the first hour hour and a half of the day okay and uh, towards that end one Final question for everybody, and would appreciate once more if you would uh, participate at healthsense.com slash Q4. And this one is about your peak days of operation. Is it Mondays and or Fridays? B, other days of the week? C, none of the above? And D, all of the above? So let's see how the group answers that. And once again, you go to healthsense.com or healthsense. Yeah, healthsense.com Q4, and you'll be presented with your choices. And simply select your choice, and we'll tabulate the results. This is about peak days of operation. Pick your choice, click done, and you're done. And at healthsense.com slash Q4. One 1,000, two 1,000, three. So let's go back and see how everybody voted. Okay. Okay. So it looks like we have a clear winner here. Mondays and or Fridays was almost 64%. Other days of the week at about 19%, none of the above at less than 2%, and about 15% all of the above. So, George, what do we learn from this uh, kind of a distribution? Well, I've been to practices, my colleagues have been, where Mondays are called disaster days at the practice because we just have this high, high volume, basically with them a close Friday, excuse me, Saturday and Sunday, and uh, people have been solving, saving their questions and their desire for appointments. So Monday, especially Monday morning, is just uh, peak, peak, peak time. Uh, Fridays are also a peak at many practices because people want to get into the practice, especially people with problems before the weekend starts. Uh, but I would say probably two-thirds of those 64% that said Mondays and Fridays uh, roughly 45, 50% are Mondays being peak days. So that, this fits in with the norm. Excellent. All right, then uh, continuing on here. Continuing on, uh, what we've seen work at some practices is relocating some of the front desk staff. Uh, for example, uh, I was recently at a three doctor practice, excuse me, at a three employee front desk uh, and there was a high degree of noise going on there. People were getting into each other's way. Uh, and very simply what we recommended is that two people remain at the front desk and one person be relocated away from the front desk and be moved into an area where they're, they're re the primary uh, receivers of incoming phone traffic and allow the front desk people to serve the patients that are checking in and also serve as a backup to that third person. Uh, so that is very often the suggestion. We've been to one practice relocating staff away from the front desk where there were four people at the front desk and what we did is we moved two of them literally just six feet back of the front desk area where they had their own uh, desks but six feet removed from where their colleagues were the two colleagues at the front desk and these people were the prime phone answerers and they used those headsets that also reduce the noise level. Another practice that we worked in quite recently, uh, we recommended that a, a key person at the front desk 
be relocated, and there was no room to put them anywhere near the front desk, and they literally were put into uh, another office, uh, and they were the prime phone answers, uh, which reduced the pressure on the two other people at the front desk. Again, headsets should be considered for everyone, even including front desk staff. And one thing I've seen people do with their headsets is if they're at the front desk and they're helping check people in, they will actually move the uh, mouthpiece away from their mouth so people will know that they're uh, not on the phone. Or in some cases, they simply take the phone off and assume that the other co colleagues will be answering the phone on their behalf. So these are some ways of redesigning the way people work by just changing where they're located. So that brings us then to the question of telephone activity and how we can address the problem. Our survey that we just did showed that Mondays and Fridays are the peak days and the first couple of hours of the day are the peak hours. So what some practices have done have brought in part-time staff for backup, and they actually will have this person or persons work uh, peak hours, usually the first hour and a half or two hours of every day, uh, and in some cases peak days, maybe backing up the staff all day Monday, uh, especially Monday morning, uh, and in some cases where we have peak days on Mondays and Fridays, having this person involved not only in the first hours of every day, but consider having that person spend more time at the practice on the peak days, such as Monday and Friday, if those are your peak days. Uh, the other thing uh, we need these people for is staff is taking time off uh, for uh, dealing with personal matters and vacation days. And it's very tough for those people to come back to work uh, with a big backlog of work to catch up. Uh, so we think that the part-time staff is a good way to go. Now, in addition to the idea of part-time staff, we've been to some practices where when all is said and done, there are sometimes there are super busy times even with this part-timer working as backup. And what some practices have done have had their billing staff, whether it's one person or more people, as backup at these super busy times, uh, which again could be your Monday mornings or all day Monday or Friday mornings or all day Friday. So this is the use of part-timers as well as considering uh, the use of employees already there, such as your billing and collection staff. Next, we want to talk about increasing phone availability. I'd like to stop at this point and remind everybody that what we really should do with our telephones is put a sign of dollars on the telephone. Uh, it needs to be recognized that the way a practice makes money is to answer the phone. You answer the phone, you serve patients. If you answer the phone, you make appointments. If people come in from their appointments, they provide money to the practice. That money in the practice pays your salaries. So phones should not be looked upon as the enemy. They should be looked upon as the single tool that brings revenues to the practice that helps pay everybody's salary. So another problem is that people have to recognize that for a new patient caller, their first impression of the practice is how the phone is answered. So a major goal that we've been covering is to make sure that phones are answered. Secondly, that patients are not put on hold for a long, long time. And there's a big irritant if you're put on hold and you're not dealt with within the next 30 seconds. 
Now, here's another negative. First dot there, eliminate phone prompts. I was at a practice in Texas six weeks ago where there were seven phone prompts. If you want to talk with the billing staff, press one. If you want to make an appointment, press two. If you want to talk with the manager, press three. If you want to talk with the nurse, press four, and so on and so forth. And then I'm saying, my God, I'm really the reason I'm calling and 50% of all callers, to repeat, 50% of all callers roughly are calling to make an appointment, and they don't want to be hit with those phone prompts. Phone prompts are a way of trying to avoid talking with the patient. And really, we've recommended eliminating them at practices because most practices that have them have four to seven phone prompts. And what we have just talked about so far is ways to be sure that the phones are answered. That's your front line of patient service. So what else will help you? Well, one practice I was at three months ago uh, was closed all day Friday afternoon from 12 o'clock on. If you called after 12 on Friday, uh, you were given a phone prompt that said the office is closed. Now, this practice happened to have eight physicians. So the question I raised was, why are we closed on Fridays? The answer, we've always done it that way. Well, that means that roughly 10% uh, of your patients are not being served. And they said, what do you mean? I said, Friday afternoon is a half day. There are 10 half days a week. Therefore, 10% of your patients are not being served on Friday afternoons. So we strongly recommend that they stagger their hours of their employees, even if the doctors, for whatever reason, didn't want to work Friday afternoons. So what also will help is let's start answering the phone earlier in the morning to avoid the log jam that we have at 9 o'clock. One way to do this, start answering the phone at 8.30. If we still have a log jam, start answering the phone at 8.00. If we're answering the phone now at 8 o'clock and we have a log jam from 8 to 8.30, consider starting your morning hours, telephone hours, at 7.30. Another thing I'd consider is closing phones later in the afternoon. Uh, a lot of practices we go to, the employees are still there, but they turn the phones off promptly at 5 p.m., yet they're still there. Uh, I think we have to remember that there are a number of people that are working people that don't want to make phone calls to their doctor's office while other people are around. And they're more likely to be calling you in the early morning hours or after 5 p.m. for purposes of privacy when they're at work. That brings us to the next item, not being closed for lunch. Uh, many practices are closed for lunch. We were at a two-doctor practice not so long ago where they were closed for lunch between 12 and 2 every day. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you expect patients to do if they're calling during their lunch time at work and don't want to share that information with their colleagues? So we reorganized the uh, answering of the phone calls and practice now answers the phone from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And they did, we did that simply by recommending that they stagger the working hours and the lunch schedules of the employees so that they'd have better phone coverage. So let's do that again. Eliminate phone prompts. Start earlier in the morning. Answer the phone later in the afternoon. Not being closed for lunch. So that means we're going to have to redesign our work hours, and we might consider one group of employees coming in at 7.30, 7.45 to start answering the phone at 8, and they leave the practice early, and other employees come in a little bit later than 8.30 or 9, and they stay on until 6 p.m., and then they stagger the lunch hours so that we have staff available to answer the phones. 
Now, the people that answer the phones during lunch hours don't have to be the same people that answer it at other times. To us, the ideal phone availability for patient convenience is having 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. coverage. It's convenient for your patients. It's convenient for your referring offices, and there will be no extra cost for your patients. So this is a very important consideration. <laughs> Last but not least, patient involvement to reduce your phone traffic. One way to reduce phone traffic is to email your appointment reminders with the date and time of the appointment. With the email reminder, you could also talk about any co-pays or deductibles that are due from the patient at the time of the visit. So doing both of those things, date and time of appointment and co-pays and deductibles, if we made that phone call as we traditionally have done, that phone call will take approximately 90 seconds, a minute and a half, if we find the patient. If we don't find the patient, we would leave that message. But the problem with leaving the message is the home phone line that we're calling may be shared by spouses and their adult children, and it may be that you don't want them to have that information uh, recorded on their answering machine. So again, this gets us back to the use of emails. We can use the emails for appointment reminders in which we talk about the date and time of the appointment. We also talk about any co-pays and or deductibles that are due. And let's take it one step further. Aside from emailing appointment reminders, we could also email normal lab results. We would have obviously called people with any abnormal lab results. So emails, practices are finding that emails are dealt with more efficiently at the practice. We can get many more emails for the same time involvement, or less time involvement than we used to when we made appointment reminders by phone. It also allows patients to respond to an email to A, either confirm, or B, to make a change an appointment and make a new one. So that's the advantage of email. And everybody nowadays is used to receiving emails and responding to them. Allowing patients to fill out forms online or faxing them forms to complete, rather than having people come to the practice and have to fill out two forms. One is patient demographic data, name, address, employer, insurance information, et cetera. And the second would be a patient history form. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if patients were able to receive that by email or by fax, and that would allow them to take the time off premises at their home to do this and not do this sitting in your reception area. Uh, I was at a cardiology practice a year and a half ago where the patient history form ran four pages with 115 items on it, people that were filling that form out in the reception area were taking five to 15 minutes to fill it out. Uh, the other thing that we have found and practices have told us, if patients receive those forms at home, then they have more time to fill them out, and sometimes they don't have the specific information at their fingertips, and they may ask a spouse or they may ask an adult child, uh, or they may call their pharmacist to find out more about the prescriptions that they're using. So this takes us to the patient involvement area, and I think now, Steve, it's a good time to allow the attendees to ask any more questions that would be of help to them or to their practices. So I will turn it over to Steve, who will explain again how you can ask questions for me to answer. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay, and uh, thank you very much, George. And let me make sure that your lines are unmuted, first of all.
Okay, and at this time, we are moving to our one of our second to last uh, opportunity for questions and answers. So, if you would like to ask a question, please simply press asterisk six on your phone at this time, and please jump right in and ask your question. Okay, I understand we have a, several questions that came in to info at healthsense.com, so I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Susan Charkin, to ask those questions. Susan? I think, again, you have to do an asterisk six. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions here. The first one is, how do I handle irate patients when I can't get them an appointment that same day or, or when they come into the office and we have to collect co-payments up front and they don't want to pay? Uh, I think that a patient that tries to indicate that they're not prepared to pay, uh, if, if they've been prepared to pay and come in and say they're not prepared to pay, uh, I see no reason why the practice should see them. Uh, but secondly, let's deal with this irate patient. I always recommend that any patient that's out in the front that's making any noise, questions, challenging, et cetera, et cetera, that that person be immediately escorted to the back and turned over to the practice manager. The manager's job is to deal with that person away from the front desk. If the manager is not there, then a key billing staff would be the person. But when you change the venue of a complaining person, you change, get it, you, you, first you might change their attitude, secondly, you get them away from other patients that are waiting in the reception area uh, that shouldn't be bothered by this noise. Uh, so I, that's the answer to the, the irate person on the, uh, at the front desk. Now, the irate person that's on the phone that's irate about co-payments, et cetera, et cetera, uh, should be reminded that if they have a problem with this, that they should talk with whoever is providing them with the insurance, and they should be asked, who pays for this insurance, do you or your employer, and allow that person to answer questions to reduce their anger factor. Uh, that's about the best we can do. But there are some people we simply cannot satisfy, but we don't hang up on them. We just uh, ask questions until we calm them down. Do you want to repeat that question, Susan, so I'd be, I can be sure that I've answered all parts of it? Sure. How do I handle irate patients when I can't get them an appointment the same day or when they come into the office and we have to collect the co-payments up front and they don't want to pay? Okay, that's, uh, I, I didn't address the first part. Patients that are irate that they can't be worked in that same day. Uh, every practice should take the time to do what we call a work-in study. The work-in study is as follows. If you've got an appointment schedule for Dr. A, on Monday, and Dr. A is scheduled to see 20 patients. At the end of the day, Dr. A had 20 patients scheduled, but on top of that, we had three work-ins, but we had no no-shows. That tells us that we should, every Monday, have appointment slots for three work-ins. In other words, these slots should be empty, that doctors should never, at any day of the week, have a schedule that's completely filled. Uh, and therefore, going back to what we talked about earlier and what was surveyed is peak days, if they're Mondays and Fridays, if we study our peak days consistently, we'll find out that Mondays and Fridays have higher working rates, and therefore we should save more appointment slots on Mondays and Fridays than we do other ways. Uh, other days. Now, the other thing to watch out for, especially in primary medicine, is your working rates skyrocket during a flu epidemic. 
And what some practices have done in primary medicine is they do not schedule any patients during the days uh, during a flu season or flu epidemic, and they simply deal with workings of that day. Otherwise, the practice becomes a disaster area. So thanks for repeating that question, Susan. No problem. I have a couple of other questions, one of which is from a dentist. A uh, dentist has uh, four full-time dentists, a part-time dentist, and four full-time hygienists. Is there a ratio of support staff to doctor or doctor to hygienist that one would expect to see? Not that I know of. Uh, some uh, It depends on uh, the doctor's specialty, where we find that uh, the doctor's uh, periodontists, for example, use more uh, hygienists than non-periodontists. And so I would say that uh, the, the way to test this is by starting out with part-timers uh, per doctor, and then is th if they could see more patients, then we would move them to a fuller-time basis. So it's the test of, of the individual practice. Some practices make high use of uh, hygienists. Others make very little use of them. And this leads me into another question we had from a physician office is, in general, what's the average number of front office staff members to physicians or a number of patients scheduled that should be? Basically, the, just the general question is, what's, is there a ratio for, for every physician there should be X number of front office people? Uh, anybody that tries to answer that question uh, is uh, naive. Uh, there is no number. Uh, it, it just is, uh, I've been to practices, I was with an allergist practice in uh, Central California, uh, an allergist that had 14 employees and he was a solo allergist. And what he did is he used a lot of nursing personnel uh, to do his maintenance work with patients. And this doctor obviously was super busy he was highly regarded in the community, and he simply kept adding nursing staff to be able to deal with uh, patients, allergy patients that were chronically ill. And there were in that part of California, there were two major allergy seasons. And in some cases, he used part timers during those peak seasons on top of what he did before. So anybody that says there is an answer to this. Uh, is naive, uh, and I, I think what it is is that some practices, based upon certain areas, uh, for example, affluent suburban communities where people have very good insurance and a lot of coverage, we tend to find a lot of unnecessary office visits because the people, even with the slightest medical problem, will immediately call a physician and want to see a physician because they have good insurance coverage and it doesn't cost them anything to see the doctor. Uh, conversely, people that are paying more out of pocket, and today, for example, uh, under Obamacare, if you are in a bronze plan and you want family insurance, your deductible is going to be somewhere close to $7,000. So that type of situation uh, means that you know, you're going to have patients are going to be less reluctant to come into your practice to be able to, to pay that, or that don't want to pay their co-pays. This is one reason we've seen an increase of traffic uh, going to non-physician offices, uh, places like CVS Pharmacy and Walgreens around the United States, uh, where people uh, can go in there and know that they're going to have a visit that's not going to cost them over $85 whereas their co-pays may be more significant than that. So getting back to the basic question, uh, there is no answer to the question. You just keep adding staff when your staff is overwhelmed. But you may be able to do this by the addition of part-timers uh, instead of just full-timers. The other problem, of course, is a physical facility problem. Where do we put them? And in some practices, it may mean uh, 
adding space. We went to one practice where their billing staff was not at the same location as the main office. They were one floor below in the same building, but they did all their paperwork, and they didn't need to be at the office because by electronics they were able to receive stuff uh, from their colleagues one floor below. So that, uh, so that's another way of not answering the question because we really don't know any numbers. We're getting a little bit of fade uh, again, George. I just wanted to remind as we're doing the Q and A, if you could uh, just speak up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me um, put this back to the entire audience again. Uh, there's a going to turn out, I think, to be a final opportunity here to ask questions. Uh, please, if you would like to ask one, please press asterisk six on your phone line at this time, or you may send a quick email to info at healthsense.com, and at the very end, we will pick those up. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay. Oh, I think uh, Susan Charkin has a quick question. Yeah, this is a quill question. Uh, it, base, it says, I usually order my office supplies during lunch. And uh, what is, can you uh, remind me what the phone number is? And also, are there any discounts uh, uh, when I order my office supplies? Okay. Uh, the answer is, uh, I understand uh, Quill is giving a discount to those people that are uh, attending this workshop, and uh, I think that'll be explained a little bit later on. Uh, but there's one question that I will raise and answer for everyone. I'm sorry, I just wanted to address that. Um, oh, go first right of ahead. all, Please speak. yeah. First of all, as far as uh, ordering uh, Quill supplies, uh, the best place to go is quill.com slash healthcare. And in fact, this month, uh, Quill Healthcare had a huge announcement and rollout where it has uh, astronomically increased its assortment of products in the medical supply area. So I would encourage everyone on the line to take a look at that because you may in fact uh, find that there's a great opportunity now to buy uh, all of your office products, as well as medical supply products uh, from a single source supplier, that being Quill.com, which also has an excellent customer service team to back you up. So uh, Quill.com slash healthcare is a great place to go. And in fact, uh, for those participants, all of you that uh, have taken time out of your valuable day to hear this valuable webinar, uh, we're also offering a discount. Uh, the information is on this chart, and in just a moment I'll be explaining how you get a complete copy of the chart so that you'll have these offer codes. But basically, if you spend uh, up to $50 or more on medical supplies, you'll get a $15 off coupon, and if you go over 100 a $30 off coupon. And you can speak to a representative about Quill.com uh, volume discounts if you plan to do uh, very large orders as well. So. Uh, I'll go back to George. It sounded like you had a couple of comments as well. Uh, uh, Steve, quick question. It says if you spend 50 on medical supplies, would that include office supplies? Um, this particular discount, I believe, is applicable to medical supplies only, but I will clarify that with uh, the Quill Team. Okay. I don't know if Lena is on the line. If you are, maybe you can press asterisk six and uh, further clarify that. Do you want me to make the comment that I was going to make, Steve? Yeah, we'll, uh, we will double check that and include a reply uh, following the session, but go ahead. Yeah, basically what I think uh, I wanted to wrap up uh, my comments is I've been to two practices in the past six months where the problem with employees was they were hiring people <clears throat> in small office settings that had no prior experience, and they did that to save money on salaries. And frankly, these practices were suffering because uh, 
a few number of staff were devoted to trying to train somebody from scratch to learn everything that they knew. And the difference between a non-experienced person and an experienced person is probably somewhere in the range of about $3,000 a year difference. Uh, and the uh, that really comes out to be you know, $2 per working hour. And the, the difference between hiring somebody for $13 or $15 uh, is a great difference. So I would say resist any pressure by the owner, physician, or physicians to say, uh, let's hire cheap. Uh, hiring cheap uh, comes back to bite you. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Uh, thank you, George. Okay, and we're pretty much getting close uh, to the wrap-up, and I do have some information here about obtaining information about this uh, presentation and, for that matter, further information. Uh, first of all, for information about Quill Healthcare, as I mentioned, you can go to uh, quill.com slash healthcare, or you can call the uh, healthcare direct line at 1-800-789-1186 for product ordering or other questions. To contact any of the presenters or MCs uh, today, including George, Susan, and myself, uh, you can simply call 1-800-497-4970, or at any time send an, in, an email, uh, as some of you have been during this session, to info at healthsense.com. Additionally, if you would like a complete copy of this presentation, uh, you can at, at any time, starting now, uh, send a quick email to charts at healthsense.com. It doesn't matter what the subject is. As soon as that email is received, an automatic email will be sent right back to you to uh, tell you how to get to the PDF version of the charts. Additionally, we will be posting the information um, about uh, the, the, from this webinar, the actual live recording will be posted at an unlisted YouTube URL, meaning only those who have a copy of the URL will be able to find it. You wouldn't just be able to do a general YouTube search at this point. Uh, but we will also be including that uh, link at charts at healthsense.com within the next 48 hours. In the meantime, if you'd like a copy of these charts, including the promotional discount uh, that I went through before, simply send charts at healthsense.com an email, and the PDF file information will be returned to you as soon as you do that. Okay, at this time, on behalf of Quill Healthcare and your MCs and presenters, I want to thank you all for having taken time out of your day to hear this very compelling presentation from Mr. George Konomikes about improving front desk performance. And we will be inviting you to future webinars. The next topic is going to be all about uh, HIPAA compliance. So I know that's a topic near and dear to our hearts. Some questions came up here. Uh, we'll let you know about that one. It will be in a little less than a month. And we appreciate your participation today. That concludes our session. Thank you all for your participation. Have a good day.